Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Bell. I'm a senior bioethicist and clinician investigator at the University Health Network, where I primarily support the Princess Margaret Cancer Center. This lecture, the Philippa Harris Lecture on Ethical Issues in Cancer Care and Research, is being co-presented by the UHN Department of Clinical and Organizational Ethics and the University of Toronto Joint Center for Bioethics. On behalf of our teams, I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you today. This lecture is being recorded and will be archived on the Joint Center for Bioethics YouTube channel. If you are a UHN employee, you will also be able to access the archived lecture on the UHN Bioethics intranet site. Today marks the 41st year of this engaging endowed lecture series. For over 40 years, this lecture has sparked engaged discussion within our community about ethical issues in cancer care as they relate to clinical care, clinical care research and organizational ethics. This lecture, lectureship was established at Princess Margaret by Bill and Pat Harris to honor their daughter Pippa, who in 1981 died from cancer at the age of 20. One of the aims of this event, in addition to memorializing a remarkable young woman, is to serve as a catalyst for open and respectful dialogue within our community about timely and important ethical issues arising in healthcare. We have been fortunate to have been given the opportunity to host accomplished speakers presenting on a range of thought-provoking and timely topics. Today's speaker, Dr. Christopher Latham, continues in this impressive tradition and will discuss clinical access, equity, and innovation in cancer care. We thank Bill and Pat Harris and their family and friends for their great generosity. They have made the Philippa, Philippa Harris Lecture on Bioethical Issues in Cancer Care a much anticipated annual event. The structure of our time together will be as follows. First, we will hear Mrs. Harris's remembrance of her daughter, Pippa. This will be followed by Dr. Lathan's presentation, after which we will have a facilitated discussion moderated by our UHN Department of Clinical and Organizational Ethics colleague, Dr. Andrea Bianchi. Please post your questions in the chat box for the discussion. If you aren't logged into YouTube and want to send in a question anonymously, please send an email to jcb.ea at utoronto.ca we will post this email address in the chat. We would like to begin by acknowledging this sacred land upon which the University Health Network operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. This territory was the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on this territory. We also stand in solidarity with the ongoing protests against racism and systemic discrimination and endeavor to work with our UHN colleagues and leaders to support efforts to advance equity, diversity and inclusion. We will now play a video that Mrs. Harris pre-recorded with the assistance of her daughter, Pippa's sister, Diana, and her family. Hello, I'm Pat Harris, Philippa's mother. Before these lectures, I like to say something different every year to tell a segment of Pippa's story but in the past, I have spoken about the phone call Bill and I received at breakfast time 43 years ago. On the phone was Pippa calling from Guelph University. She said, I can't walk. Bill told her he was coming right away. He picked her up and drove her straight to Toronto Western Hospital, where she had a bed by the afternoon and had the best care available for cancer at that time. And we realized that she was very fortunate. But after 40 years of lectures, I have run out of amusing stories to tell about Pippa's character. But here is a poignant one. As Pippa's illness rapidly progressed, she was prescribed morphine for pain. And Pippa told our family doctor, David Smith, she was worried that she would become addicted to it. But Dr. Smith's mouth curved, 
but he gravely told her that he just wanted her to be comfortable, and she was. It's wonderful that the Pippa lectures can now be heard from coast to coast in Canada. And many thanks again to the Bioethics Committee at Princess Margaret Hospital for once again engaging a prestigious speaker. We all thank Dr. Christopher Lathan for talking to us this afternoon. Thank you, Pat. These are very moving reflections and a wonderful prelude to our speakers today, a speaker's presentation today. It now gives me great pleasure to formally introduce our speaker. Dr. Christopher Latham is a clinical oncologist focusing on the care of lung cancer patients and is the founding director of the Cancer Care Equity Program at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, a clinical outreach program that aids in the diagnosis and treatment of cancer for patients at federally qualified health centers in the United States. He is the Chief Clinical and Access Equity Officer at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Associate Chief Medical Officer, Director of the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Network. Dr. Lathan's research interests are primarily centered on the effects of race, class, and access to care in cancer outcomes, including racial disparities in lung cancer treatment, differences in access to precision medicine by race, and social class and the equitable distribution of new treatment across historically marginalized populations. Dr. Latham aims to bridge the gap between research efforts focused on disparities and the realities of patient care by developing interventions to increase access to high quality care. This work is developed in part through engagement with affected communities. Specific projects include development of cancer-focused health equity measurement and data reporting tools, patient navigation integration throughout the cancer service line, and improving the uptake of pre precision medicine in underserved communities to advance cancer care. Without further ado, I would now like to welcome Dr. Latham to present. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bell. I, I really I really appreciate the introduction, and I wanted to say um, thank you to the uh, Center for Bioethics, and, as well as thank you to the to the Harris family for um, supporting these lectures over time and, and inviting me as a speaker. I, I really, 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 um, I'm happy to be a part of, of this, and and hopefully be able to share with you some of the work that we're doing, and 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 also have an engaging discussion as well. So I'm going to share my slides, uh, and give me just a moment here, and I. I think it should be perfect. Great. So, um, so what I'd like to do in in the next hopefully forty minutes or so is uh, talk about um, health equity and health inequities. And um, so, I, I this is a I always say um, about fifteen years ago these conversations and this these lectures would have to spend some time convincing people that there were differences in access to care and outcomes when you look at race or class or immigrant status and, you know, uh, in, in, in primary language. And, you know, the, the things that we know all make up part of the social determinants of health. And, it, you know, as a clinician, as a medical oncologist, and I'm a medical oncologist, I still see patients, um, a thoracic medical oncologist, so I treat lung cancer patients, and I've had uh, many conversations like the one that uh, Mrs. Harris had mentioned uh, in, in the prologue, uh, where you're talking to folks about how to take pain medication and really helping people come to terms with a difficult disease. The good news is since 2001, 2002, when I started my training, and now our treatment options have increased greatly across the cancer spectrum. Unfortunately, there are still some differences in who's getting the treatments and how folks are doing on those treatments. And that's going to spend a little time on that today. And then I'm going to move, uh, hopefully pretty quickly, to interventions, because I feel like descriptive research in disparities has been really the hallmark of the work that people have been doing for over 100 years. And, and I'll tell you a little bit about um, how we decided to make some of these changes and really focus on interventions, which I think is where most folks in the field are going and then end with some unique op opportunities and, and a call to action. So just a little bit about my background. Um, um, you know, I, um, I, I'm from the United States and I grew up in uh, Massachusetts in uh, a town in Western Massachusetts called Springfield, which was a manufacturing town. 
And my father actually uh, drove a fork truck for a living. He grew up in a very small town in Alabama, in the United States. Uh, Carrollton, Alabama had a population of about 1,000 people. He was one of nine. Uh, he dropped out of school in the sixth grade to work on the farm and take care of his family. And like many African-Americans in the United States, he uh, you know, emigrated to the North for jobs. And in the book that you'll see uh, up top there, and hopefully you can see on my, uh, on my screen here, you can see The Warmth of Other Sons. And that is an incredible, incredible book uh, that if you haven't had a chance to read by Isabella Wilkerson, um, talking about the uh, migration patterns of the sins of slaves in the United States, um, moving from the South to the big cities in the Midwest, the West Coast and the Northeast. And that story was my, like my story as well. And uh, my mother was from a, a smaller community outside of uh, Myrtle Beach, uh, South Carolina, Horry County, South Carolina. And um, as I mentioned my father, he dropped out of school in sixth grade and he was he's really functionally illiterate. I didn't realize that until I was older that he could memorize stop signs and read those sort of things, but he actually couldn't read. My mother uh, did finish high school. She wasn't able to uh, complete her uni any university training. She worked as a, uh, what we used to call a nurse's aide back then, and we call now clinical assistants. Uh, and, and so my distance traveled from this and being in a community that I didn't really see physicians and certainly not physicians of color. Um, I saw a lot of people of many different races who were working and uh, and everybody I knew was working poor, whether they were white, whether they were uh, Latino, whether they were uh, East Asian uh, or, or Black or African American. Uh, it was a big community in and around the manufacturing uh, jobs in Springfield in the early 70s. And of course, class and race had major impacts, and these were not just academic questions to me. What you see in the middle here is just to say that I'm a descendant of slaves uh, uh, you know, from on both sides of my family. Um, I apologize that the, uh, the animations didn't come out very well there, but that is uh, Joseph White, and this is a, uh, uh, a slave ledger. Uh, and certainly on, this is on my father's side, but also on my mother's side. So I am a descendant of slaves in the U.S. And so, of course, those sorts of things did impact uh, and, and do impact uh, my access and opportunities. And I just want to move things a little bit here. Sorry. Uh, Oh, there. And the other book I wanted to talk about that really changed my life and really put the spectrum of uh, what I would be interested in if I was in university and I was a biochemistry major, I, I took a sociology course and they started me off with some of the work of uh, the, so the sociologist William Julius Wilson. And this wasn't the first book that I read by him, but it's the one that really changed me uh, even before I was thinking about a career in medicine, uh, The Truly Disadvantaged, and where he talked about the inner city underclass of public policy and really started talking about the impact of manufacturing jobs and social class. And so uh, even before I got the opportunity to go into medicine, these are areas that I was interested in. So I wanted to just make sure that we had the opportunity to uh, talk about the words that we're going to use and have a discussion when we talk about race, because race is going to come up. And certainly, I'm going to talk about this from a U.S. perspective. Uh, so I'll spend some time talking about African American experiences in the United States. You know, but certainly, as we know, these experiences, whether you're talking for historically marginalized uh, populations, whether you're talking about African Americans, whether you're talking about Indigenous peoples, whether you're talking about uh, you know, folks who, uh, uh, immigrants, um, East Asian immigrants in the United States, there, there are elements of these that are universal. There are unique stories that are happening in each one of those experiences that lead to the systemic inequities that we see. So we're going to talk about uh, some of this in the African-American experience, but certainly I believe that there are, there are certainly uh, areas of that that carry all the way through. So race, of course, is a social construct, and, and I know for the social scientists and many of the bench scientists and many folks out there that, that makes sense. But for a lot of times when I'm talking about this with my family members, and I say that there's no biologic definition of race, people look a little quizzical. And of course, that's because, you know, race really is a, something we see on the outside or for, for, you know, it's a phenotype. It's something that we see and it's a social definition imposed by others. Uh, you know, uh, and, and race is really, when we try to use it in research, a shortcut uh, for ancestry. What we're really interested in is where are your people from? The race designation carries a lot of the uh, social determinants of health, right? If you have structural inequities in your system, and then certainly race, when we're measuring self-reported race, many times we're, re we're measuring that. Sometimes people confuse this with ancestry when they're looking at, you know, 
what happens to genes, right? So race uh, is a shortcut to ancestry, but ancestry gets us to genetics and race and an ancestry do not line up. Genetics are really what contribute to your risk of cancer along with environment and diet and other things. And so I think some of that confusion where people see race and they think that they're thinking genetics, we just wanna be very clear. And as we target drugs these days that are focused on you know, mutations in the cancer sometimes and some markers that are even what we call germline, the mutations that are in you know, passed down from person to person, that is separate from race. And I think the two of them often get confused. And, and when we're looking at inequity, sometimes people wanna talk about biologic differences between the different races. And again, race doesn't really have biologic difference. There are ancestral uh, differences in germline things that are passed down between folks, but that is not always track with race. And so for many people, they feel like it's more convenient to focus on the biological differences, what we used to call race medicine. And really, for you're talking about historically marginalized patients, whether in, in the U.S. or worldwide, if there's no discussion about the overall institutional inequities and all of the barriers and political ramifications, it's not really, you're not being, you're not having a fair discussion about the inequities in, in the exclusion. So just speaking a little bit about health inequities, right? So I think um, certainly in, in the U.S., cancer is the second leading cause of death, and there's significant disparities that have existed in historically marginalized neighborhoods. And we're talking about communities of color broadly, those who are lower income of all races, rural and immigrant communities. Um, and financial distress and some of this work that, you know, many people have published on, I would say that most of the work on financial toxicity um, talks about the true story about how cancer makes you poor, right? Cancer and a cancer diagnosis really impacts people and it impacts them financially. And over the last 15 to 20 years, there's been a lot of conversation about that. My interest has always been in that, but also what happens if you're poor at the time of the cancer diagnosis? And there have been less, substantially less publications on that. What happens when you're poor at the time of cancer diagnosis? And we published along with others have shown uh, data that shows that financial distress at the time of diagnosis has a negative impact in the quality of life separate from the cancer, uh, a negative impact in psychological well-being and worsening symptoms at presentation. And then when you look at the uh, Black or African-American experience in the U.S., certainly uh, compared to white patients, uh, African-Americans are, di are diagnosed at later stage for colorectal breast and cervical cancer, African-Americans are less likely to receive stage appropriate care. And I always say this, you know, if you look at a treatment, if you wanna pick a modality, generally poorer folks of all races, uh, rural folks, African-Americans are, are less likely to receive that. And I think, again, if you, if you, if you look at folks in countries where you had a uh, systemic uh, bias and you've had institutional policies, you're gonna see similar effects. And overall, even though the incidence and mortality for cancer rates are coming down, and that's that's a good thing. I mean, we've really been able to make some dents in things. Um, it, it, there's still some differences when you look at uh, uh, race differences that are still there. And then also, it's important for us not to aggregate all the data together, because some people might look at some of the data in the U.S. on race. You'll see that African-Americans in general have high mortality. Then you'll see white folks listed next. Then you'll see uh, a bar that might show a lower uh, uh, mortality rate and incidence rate for folks who self-identify as East Asian or uh, Latino or Latinx. And what we want to say is that's a that's a homogenous uh, uh, trying to trying to put a, a single title on a very heterogeneous group, because what we know is for people who are coming from different places, they have different risks of cancer. So, for example, if you're immigrating from Mexico, you might have higher rates of cervical cancer. If you're immigrating, uh, you know, if you're if you're coming from East Asia, there are higher rates of gastric cancer. So the point is, even though the individual risk compared to others, when you put everybody together, you might say oh, there is less risk in this particular ethnic group. Every, each and every group has cancer uh, and as, as a leading cause of death, uh, one of the leading causes of death, and there are differences in different groups based on their environmental risk. And this is just a, kind of the representation of what I was talking about, looking at blacks and whites in the US and looking at uh, trends in cancer death rates, where you can see um, you know, there is there was a huge gap between with uh, black men having the worst mortality rate, which they still do, and a huge gap between uh, black men, white men, and then black women and then white women. And certainly, while there has been an improvement, and we want to celebrate the improvement, we see that the gap still remains. Um, and then uh, this is just kind of making it very local for us. If you think about in Boston and and um, being at the Dana Farber, and I think I always think people think that um, uh, one of the things I tell the the trainees who work with is that. Um, 
intellect and education does not inoculate one against systemic oppression. Uh, and that goes on everybody's side. I think sometimes people we think that that's the case. And you know, even though uh, Boston is a is you know is similar uh, uh, to Toronto, it's, it's, it's a healthcare mecca. Uh, there are, we have a problem. We still have problems with representation. And if you look at this, um, this on this side, uh, the Boston Globe, with the the one, the major newspaper in Boston in 2017, did a great series focusing on race. One of the subsets really spoke to health, and this is just a listing of the percentage of Black doctors at Boston hospitals. And knowing that you know the percentage of uh, Black folks in Boston right is you know more over 20 percent, and then you're looking at the representation, and you can see that. Um, the percentage of uh, U.S. doctors is about 4%. If you look at, uh, you know, my institution, the percentage of Black doctors at that time, it's gone up, but, uh, it, you know, not that much, 2.2%. Uh, uh, and even in the safety net hospital where I had trained uh, originally, it was uh, 5%. So there is a, a healthcare community that doesn't really look like, uh, excuse me, healthcare professionals that don't look like some of the um, marginalized communities. And that's a, that's a major issue. It's not the only issue. And then just to show you, uh, you know, what have we been doing? If you look at this recent New England Journal uh, paper talking about um, United States uh, medical school representation, as you can see, we've done some good things, right? Over the, you know, the past, you know, really 40 years, uh, you can see there's been an increase uh, for women of all races. And, and that's just a medical school representation. Certainly we still need a lot more room to go in leadership and in faculty positions um, and we really need to kind of move beyond that. But certainly there has been at least some movement there. But what we can see is if you're looking at the percentage of uh, black men specifically, you can tell that really it's been right around 3% since 1980. And really, if anything, might have dipped and came back a little bit. Whereas for black women, there has been uh, at least a moderate increase with a plateauing. Um, and I think, you know, uh, this is really telling us that we, even with all of our interests and our thoughts, really, we haven't really changed or moved this mark uh, in over 40 years. Um, and this, you know, I, I will say this a little bit, uh, you know, uh, the, the tragedy of, of it really thinking about the COVID pandemic did a lot of things. And one of the things that happened is that um, incidents that have been happening in a community of color, and we're going to speak specifically to the African-American community in the United States, which had been happening since time immemorial, people got to see them in a different way. And I'm sure there's gonna to be tons of dissertations continue to be written by what was it about uh, Floyd particularly, because it wasn't Amon Arbery, it wasn't uh, Breonna Taylor. There was something about people witnessing what happened uh, to Mr. Floyd that really triggered this racial awakening. And so before Floyd, um, I was very careful. We didn't talk about Systemic racism, actually. Uh, Thea James, one of the um, uh, physicians at, uh, at Boston Medical Center, who's been a, a tremendous advocate for patients and for thinking about racial justice and racial equity, said, you know, pre Floyd, many of us who were giving talks, we talked about structural inequities, we talked about social determinants of health, we never said structural racism. We didn't want to make people feel bad. And after Floyd, we were able to say that. This um, this particular paper, there's an excellent paper that was uh, published in 2018. It's uh, really more uh, of an economic paper, but it's talking about economic mobility in the United States. It was an excellent paper. We're not going to get into all the details, but they controlled for many elements of family structure as well as socioeconomic status. And the goal was to look at um, economic mobility. If you're born in poverty, are you able to move out of poverty in the United States? And what were some of the factors that influenced it? And what we found is that um, Black men had the least likelihood to be able to move out of poverty. Uh, by quite a bit. And this was independent of family structure, which is one of the things that people often say is impacting different communities. And this was really, um, not only were they less likely to be able to move out of poverty, they were more likely to slip, if they get out of poverty, to slip back into poverty. And there's a conversation about this article that happened in the Boston Globe. Uh, and the question was, why is racism the only explanation for this phenomenon, right? Uh, and the idea is the person says, you know, I know that this paper said that the family structure was an issue, but maybe there's something that happens to black boys. And the key is, he said, so why do authors take the easy way out and blame amorphous racism? Now, I say this is a pre-Floyd discussion because people wouldn't say this now, but that doesn't mean that people don't think it. And at the, Dr. Kendi, uh, before everybody knew Dr. Kendi, who, who he was, uh, he said the easy way out is to say there must be something wrong with the boys. 
It's an easy way out that Americans have traditionally taken to explain racial disparities since the founding of the United States. Either there's something wrong uh, with your policies over time, or you're saying that there's something inherently wrong with these black boys. And I think you just did a, a great, a great job of answering that question. Okay. So that's kind of the backdrop, right? So let's talk a little bit about cancer and uh, treating cancer and thinking about our, our treatment of uh, patients with cancer as we move forward. So what we know is that, you know, cancer care and treating cancer is difficult. I don't, you know, as a medical oncologist, I, I always say we're an end user of a system. There are primary care docs, there are advanced practice clinicians of all, of all types uh, who are actually way upstream of us. They are the people that you go to with your complaints first, and then it takes some time and some procedures before you meet a cancer specialist. Usually, uh, you know, beforehand, uh, maybe it's a surgeon or another proceduralist, um, but it's complicated and it's not just clinically complicated. Uh, then there's also a, in the United States, we have a lot of insurance barriers. And I think even in places that have a universal system, uh, there are regional issues and is other issues that can be complicated. Uh, and then there's in our particular case in many cancer centers, there uh, their perception in the communities, near, nearby marginalized communities, is not the same as it is perhaps in affluent suburbs. And that's a big thing in the United States. And of course, how, how COVID imp impacted things is, is, is really important. And um, this is really, uh, we published a little bit about the um, our hypothesis of the iterative process of the cancer diagnosis. And, and certainly this is just our view of this and, and people have done other models as well. But the idea would be, you know, you can present uh, in multiple ways with your original diagnosis. You can have asymptomatic screening. You can present with a non-urgent cancer symptom. Since I'm a lung cancer doc, I can say that's like a cough, right? It's probably not going to be cancer. It's probably upper respiratory infection, you know, but, you know, that's one way you can present. And then there's what I call the urgent cancer-related symptoms. And again, keeping it related to uh, lung cancer for a minute, that would be a bloody cough. So that's very different, right? Frank blood is very different and that might get you to an emergency department. And we split this to folks who don't have a primary care doc, which is uh, relatively much more common than you would think in the United States. But even if you do, the dotted lines are places where people, we might lose patients. We might lose them in that we see them, we know that you need to go to a screening, but then you have to go see someone else or come back. And then for working peoples of all races, you have to take time off work, you don't get paid, who's gonna watch your kids? Our system is not really built for us to think about that. And sometimes that's where we can lose people. And we can, and we say, oh, they didn't show up or we made this appointment. But did we make the appointment at a time that they could, that they could come? Did we help them with transportation? We're gonna get into that a little bit more when we talk about navigation. But these are all areas where people get lost. And the only place where you can get a workup that you know is very quick is you go to the emergency room for this urgent symptom, and then they, your your symptoms weren't inpatient care. Well, we'll figure out what's happening probably within the next day or two, but by that time you have advanced disease, right? And so this is one of the ways the iterative pro process of diagnosis of cancer means that it's difficult sometimes. So just to, you know, if we think about this, we know the cancer diagnosis is complex. You know, you have to really go through this complex web of experience and move forward. It's not just you know clinical, there's referral patterns and insurance and all those other issues in the United States, but even if not, there's regional differences that one has to take into account. And then, as I mentioned, the cancer centers, uh, you know, certainly in the U.S. have a tendency of being seen as, quote unquote, an ivy tower. This is a place where you would go, but are there, are there a consistent focused clinical navigation programs uh, focused on uh, marginalized patients? And as, is there a sustained clinical presence in the communities? And, and certainly, you know, we know that access matters and, and the better our drugs get, the more the access matters uh, actually. And, you know, we really need this impactful, inclusive, high quality care for um, historically marginalized patient populations. And in this particular discussion, we could talk about, you know, uh, BIPOC populations, we can talk about elderly folks, uh, rural folks, uh, you know, folks of uh, lower socioeconomic position. And, um, you know, we're talking about in a, in a predominantly English speaking country, uh, limited English proficiency, where, you know, the language you speak can also in, impair that. So, you know, I think what we need to do and what we need to talk about, and this is the, we'll talk a little about the work that I do in a minute, is think about our community engagement, right? We really want to make sure that we are developing relationships with your nearby community. And this is hard for cancer centers. We have things that we need to do. We're thinking about treatment. We're thinking about getting people in for their screening. This is a separate conversation about 
Are you present in the communities without an ask? Do you have relationships with your, um, your safety net institutions that are of mutual benefit? Um, and, and how do you establish trust with you know, different marginalized communities if you're only coming in and asking for a certain thing? Oh, we have a great trial. We wanna get out there. We wanna get more people of X on this trial. You know, what, where were you before when you were trying to just educate about clinical trials in general? Um, and have you done that on a, on a regular basis? Um, how do you broke your relationships in cultural humility? How does the community hear about it? Is this one, one of the things we found during COVID, we came out there ready to talk about cancer. Nobody wanted to talk about cancer. So we switched, we had to really kind of, we're a cancer center, we're a standalone cancer center, but honestly, the world really wanted us to talk about vaccinations and, 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 and make sure we heard people on that and make sure we educated on that. And how do we give back to the community um, when we do work with them? Writing our grants, training people, putting a pipeline in for jobs. And you know, we're not just talking about physicians or clinicians or APPs and nurses. We're like, there's a whole bunch of things that, that, that hospitals and cancer centers do that we can help the community with and have a pipeline for folks who normally didn't have opportunities. And how do we sustain these? And the, the key at the end here is you know, staying for the long haul. We tend to be as academicians, we're writing grants. So you write a grant and then you're coming in in the grant cycle and then you gotta go and do something else. And so that's why we need a little more help. It can't be just an academic question. It has to be you know, your community benefits and, and, and other folks who actually continue to maintain relationships in the community. I wanna take the opportunity now to talk a little bit about some of our uh, interventions that we've used and, and how we develop them a little bit. Um, just, you know, giving for those of you who know Boston, you know, some of the communities that we serve in and around the Boston area, um, based on our community needs assessment, we found there are a few neighborhoods um, that really uh, pose extra challenges based on social and economic environmental forces. So that for us in and around us, these are communities called Mattapan, Roxbury, Mission Hill, Jamaica Plain, and Dorchester. And yes, they are a uh, higher percentage of what we would say black and brown communities, but certainly it's not just um, uh, black and brown folks in those communities, but certainly it is uh, overrepresented. And so we are looking um, specifically to make sure that we take care of folks in those communities and, and thinking about how we have interacted in the past and how we wanna interact in the future. Our cancer care equity program really, um, the concept came up in around 2010. Uh, and the idea was to think about uh, how would we have local impact uh, for communities in and around us and become a national model for translating some of the equity research and interventions. And to really prep for this, uh, somebody had asked me, one of my mentors had asked me, said, Chris, if you could do one thing, uh, if you could have one thing um, to really uh, impact uh, access to care for um, folks in and around the neighborhoods, especially for marginalized communities, what would you think about? And I actually called all the cancer centers in the US and it did this informal landscape survey. And what we found is that back in 2009, 2010, every cancer center had a disparities research program, but no one had a sustained clinical access program that was beyond one cancer. So you might've had one program that uh, did a navigation or access program and, and usually in a gender specific cancer, like a, a, a prostate cancer or a uh, you know, uh, or, or, you know, prostate cancer or breast cancer, but there wasn't a, a, a program that really talked about expedited workups and nobody was really focusing on broadening access in general. And I found that as a, a, a problem. So what we decided to do is build a navigation program around the nurse navigator and embed ourselves using a co-location model in uh, some of the federally qualified health centers. And in the US, these are health centers that are really supposed to take care of the most vulnerable patients. And there's models like that in urban centers, in uh, rural areas, and then there are counterparts in, uh, in, in for, uh, for, our, for our native uh, populations on different, uh, on different reservations as well. So these are, these, are, these are federally funded community health centers that are not necessarily licensed by a, a larger system. And you know what we did, uh, we had these uh, on-site cancer outreach clinics staffed by a clinical team. Uh, now it's a physician assistant, but at the time it was myself and a few other oncologists. We had a nurse director and a patient navigator. And the idea was we see uh, patients under the license of that federally qualified health center and the, the primary care docs refer patients for diagnostic evaluation uh, and we evaluate them there. 
Uh, and if the patients had an active cancer or question, then we would navigate them to the Dana-Farber or to the Brigham, or if they um, had a relationship at another place, we actually would navigate them there. It was all about what worked for the patients. The reasons they sent people to us usually are around uh, the questions of cancer screening, diagnostic workups, referrals for second opinions, and then we started getting uh, genetic evaluations. And so we talked to our colleagues. Uh, Judy Garber was very supportive of this in, in her breast group and she had been a pioneer on, on the high-risk uh, genetics clinic. And she actually sent some of her uh, genetic counselors and uh, her, her medical geneticists to our clinic. So we had this kind of unique opportunity to do these evaluations there as well. And so our criteria really were new or existing cancer diagnosis. That was a smaller percentage, but any people who had questions about uh, blood, blood work, benign hematology, uh, specific breast problems, or any, what I would say, lump, bump, uh, or issue that their primary care doc thought could be related to cancer. And uh, just to give you a quick view, uh, this work is going to be published soon, uh, but this has been published in abstract form in the past. We have over 600 patients that uh, have signed our cohort. Uh, we have 700 patients that we've seen uh, over the years. Uh, and so we can see that the vast majority of patients in this particular uh, clinic uh, self-identify as Black, non-Hispanic, Although since we have a large Dominican patient population, you can see 26% would say that they are both uh, Black or African-American and Hispanic. And then we can see that uh, you know, the other percentages that we have are folks who self-identify as white, 16%, folks who, um, uh, excuse me, 10%, uh, uh, and then folks who identify as white and also would say that they're Hispanic were 16%. And what are the reasons for referral? Oh, and I have to, I, I don't want to neglect to say that 95% of the patients we're seeing in this federally qualified health center are below the, the federal poverty line. Um, reasons for referral, well, you know, 30% evaluate for cancer. Uh, we had some benign heme, uh, but this 20% genetic counseling. And then somewhere around 2013, we started implementing uh, lung cancer screening. And that was before it was covered by insurance. So we had a grant, but then we transitioned, of course, once it became covered by insurance. So did we do a lung cancer screening, smoking cessation? And then some people were diagnosed with cancer in another place. Uh, usually a different country, and then they needed to get set up and, and linked into survivorship, and we did that as well. Um, so was it all roses? Um, you know, there are some good things. The PCPs, um, after some skepticism, really enjoyed the program. And I say PCPs, but in a lot of the federally qualified health centers, there are less and less MDs. There are a lot of advanced practice clinicians, which is great, but there's a lot of young advanced practice clinicians, people who are really just coming out of their training who need a little guidance. And I think it has been very helpful. We also do some didactic education to the community as well as uh, in, into the faculty and staff. We uh, have some metrics that are really looking at uh, decreasing the patient time, wait time between abnormal finding and diagnostic resolution. Uh, and also we found that the, we're strengthening the provider bonds in the community. They knew who we were. We've been there now for over uh, 12 years. Uh, we developed new programs. Uh, like I said, the genetics evaluations, uh, lung cancer screening. Uh, we found that the dentists, uh, there are dentists who were doing pro bono work there. And some of the patients were coming in. They didn't even have, um, they didn't really have primary care docs. Uh, and so the dentists, uh, we talked to them and they were sending folks to us for um, uh, oral uh, cancer evaluations as well as lung cancer screening. Uh, and it was really, we did some also some work in uh, re residential addiction uh, recovery programs on tobacco cessation. But it's tricky, right? The healthcare climate changes. There are competitions even between these federally qualified health centers. So we started in one center and the goal is always to expand the model to others. And then people say, oh no, this is our program. Why are you expanding to that? federally qualified health center down the road when we compete. And we're, of course, like thinking about this holistically. Um, balancing the goals of the community health center versus the, ac the academic center goals. Okay, Chris, you got a cohort. Let's get some tissue. Well, actually, the CEO of the center didn't want us to get tissue, so we didn't. But that caused some frustration. And there were even conversations where like, well, you shouldn't even be there if you can't flip this to some large uh, R01. And, and that's where I might have been a little stubborn and said, no, we're, we're going to keep it there. We developed a clinical program. We're going to keep it. We have a cohort. We don't have to get tissue, and we're not going to try to force it if the if the community leaders don't want us to. I would say when you're in somebody else's house, you really try to follow their rules. So I think um, there's a lot of other things. We could have a whole separate conversation on how challenging it is to do community-based work in an academic setting. We don't exist alone. So uh, there are other folks who are doing other work at the Dana-Farber, and we try to work with our other groups, and that's really important to us. And most of the work I've been talking about is uh, focused outward, uh, so on the outreach clinic. 
during this time period over the last couple of years, as our cancer care equity work grew, uh, there was an opportunity to really think about this across the Dana Farber and changing this work from small boutique level work to really giving um, executive leadership work across. So uh, now in the chief clinical access and equity role, my, my goals are broader um, to kind of help this measurement, think about the data and how we're measuring things, uh, to advance these um, infrastructure uh, innovations, but also think about using uh, our own network and other places where we're delivering care to push these things through using our operations and clinical research. And then work nationally and internationally to really think about what are other people doing and how do we integrate and make sure that, the, that, that we're integrating the best practices. And I would say to you, we have lots of buckets of what we do. We're not going to go through everything in the last couple of minutes. But what we will do, uh, we, we talked a little bit about um, this uh, clinical outreach program, and we are now in three different excuse me, two different federally qualified health centers. Uh, and uh, we also have, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, our navigation program, our community focused navigation program that we're integrating into uh, our disease center process at the main camp, cancer center. And there's research work that we're doing that we're not gonna to touch on today and our work with our community outreach uh, partners. This is just our organizational structure. And I just wanna point out the focal point and really a partner in this work, our nurse director, uh, Ludmila Svoboda, who has really been with our program, the first person we hired in the program. And this is a, 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 a very talented nurse who took a pay cut uh, and took an uncertain job with an uncertain leader uh, over 12 years ago to come out into communities and really has, has been fantastic. And the whole program uh, really revolves around some of the work. Uh, and I'm just gonna uh, move forward here. It's good. All right. All right. So I I have some time. I'm not gonna speed up too much, but I want to get to make sure we get to some of the other questions. So I'm gonna talk about our community focused patient navigation, right? So um I think the key to focus on here is everybody, you know, the the data on navigation is pretty clear. It's very interesting because if you talk to hospital administrators, they keep saying, I, I need to see more data. But those of us who've been looking at this work, and if you talk to people, the pioneers of this work, uh, you're talking to Electric Pasket, and if you talk to, uh, you know, uh, Karen Freund and Tracy Battaglia, and, and many, many more, the, you know, all the people have been doing, you know, and Harold Freeman, who really came up with, you know, utilizing uh, community-focused uh, navigation to, to alleviate barriers for uh, historically marginalized uh, communities uh, way back when, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. We all know that there's data that shows that you decrease time to resolution. We know that if you focus navigation on the people who need it the most, it's the most effective. There have been cost effectiveness studies done that have shown that navigation generally at worst pays for itself, but many, many programs showing that uh, it actually can be a benefit right, uh, to, the, to the cancer center. But, you know, was there a large randomized clinical trial? Well, there was uh, and there are, but it didn't, you know, not looking at those kind of outcomes. So this is really uh, uh, one of those things where people are always reinventing the wheel. And we think that there's room for navigation, really, from prevention all the way through survivorship and the end of life. But we're going to focus our particular community focus pilot from the detection, diagnosis, and treatment phase. And the idea was, um, you know, we were going to have a team that's at our main cancer center, not just the group, the group that we have outside, but our main cancer center, uh, who is going to uh, find the patients who are already in our system, who meet criteria, and actually direct and help those patients uh, ac access resources and navigate them to appointments and even going as far as sitting in the room with them when they see uh, the clinicians and helping them fill out uh, paperwork and other things. So the idea is, you know, our team will reach out to patients before their appointment, welcome them to the Institute, express, this is what's going to happen. You come in to the building because it's a scary place to come into the cancer center, right? And then they do an, an assessment uh, to try to get to uh, some of the barriers up front. Uh, again, if we know up front, uh, it's great what we know about clinicians, doctors in particular, we're coming in, we're going to talk about stuff, and unless the patient gives us a flag in the room, we don't always reach out to all the services that we have available. Um, and then we connect folks to the resources. So we work, and you'll see with many others, there is a nurse navigation team that runs the clinical internal navigation for the patient's clinical service. There is a uh, we have an incredible nursing uh, and patient care services team that really does uh, deal deals with resources for patients, and our, our navigators will work hand in hand with them. So we're trying really hard. We're not duplicating any efforts. 
And then we guide patients through the visit, escort them to the disease center if the patient wants. If the patient says, I don't need an escort, then obviously we don't force it upon them, but we do ask them about it. And we help them with some of the paperwork you got to fill out. Uh, if the patients don't show up or before they, their appointment, we call them and remind them. If they don't show up, we call them and ask why instead of just rescheduling and go, hey, they didn't come. Um, and then we try to help them and help them with their expectations. And then the key here is integrating this and ha having it a one-off. There are many navigation programs that cancer centers have, but they tend to be separate from the clinical operations. And my feeling was if we integrate it into the clinical operations, it makes it even more effective. And so that's what this is, just showing you that we have a community patient-focused navigator, but they're working with the resource specialists, the financial counselors, the oncology nurse navigators, the social workers, patients at the center. And we're trying to bring all these things around, focused on our patients in need. And just to give you an idea, right, so we started with uh, GI, and this is philanthropically funded, uh, although the institutional support is that once we show efficacy, they are going to integrate this into the operations budget. Um, we've also started with the breast program and then um, um, thoracic, and we're about to start GYN. And the, the goal is to get to every disease center and into our network. Um, just to give you an idea of what the criteria are on in the beginning, when we first started, we wanted to see what the, the volume was going to be. We really were talking about adult patients. Pediatric oncology tends to be much better than adult oncology about this as far as when a pediatrician sees that there's a cancer issue, getting them to the cancer center and having the cancer center doing the workup, there's not as much pushback there. They understand that's part of the, the job. In adult oncology, there's a lot of what we call like, well, what's the diagnosis? Did you get this biopsy first? And which specialist are you going to see? So um, we started with adults. Uh, my uh, colleague, Kira Bono, who does a lot of his work in pediatric oncology, and she and I uh, speak regularly and share tactics that we can use. So we, we this is not, uh, it doesn't have to be only for adults, and I'm sure some elements of this will be adjusted for pediatrics. And it, the, the original criteria is you have to be living in one of our priority neighborhoods. Uh, and then, you know, you know, if you were referred by um, one of our folks in the community, that could trigger you, or if you're living in one of our priority neighbor, neighborhoods. It was race agnostic, or language agnostic, just becoming from um, our priority neighborhoods. And then as we went to phase two, when we realized the volume was manageable, then we said, okay, look, it, these were just for new patients. We said, okay, now folks who are going, undergoing active treatment, established patients, you can refer those in, you can be in one of our priority neighborhoods, and then you could also be a person who, you know, you missed an appointment and they could say, hey, why'd you miss an appointment? If you missed an appointment and either you were um, from one of our neighborhoods or you were had an insurance uninsured or one of our safety net insurances, uh, certainly, um, you know, one of, from one of the marginalized communities uh, or if English was not your preferred language, any of those would also uh, be expanded out to, to that group. And it's been very popular with, um, with our providers. Um, and so we have metrics. I mean, the key here is, in the beginning, these are process metrics. We have a separate data group that's building out the outcome measures, right? You want to get eventually get to survival. You want to eventually get to that. It's going to take years to get to your survival data. So we have to start with the process metrics. How many people? What were the barriers? Did we recruit, decrease no-show rates? Are the patients happy with it? Are the providers happy with it? Are the nurses happy with it, right? Um, do we have a decrease in, in the time to the consults? And are we collecting the data? And are we utilizing our systems to, you know, uh, that allow us to contact the patient? So this is, you know, some of those metrics that are trying to show that we're doing the work. And then we have this analytics group that we're trying to put more metrics together and build this out over time. Um, and then we're writing our publication, a white paper for process paper, and then we're going to move forward. We're going to do some qualitative work. And then getting the clinical data, we have a senior business intelligence analyst that's in a part of our program now who's building out the dashboards and letting us synthesize the data. So I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time here in the interest of, of the time. I want to stop for discussion soon. But this is one of the early iterations of the, of the dashboard. You know, how many new patients are eligible, who are the patients seen, and those reports come to our team, and then we try to flag things. I think the best thing to do now, I'm just going to get you to stop with like uh, in the next two minutes with your know, current opportunities and challenges, right? So I think if you think about unique opportunities for clinical access and innovation projects, right? So we have to really think about broadening the partnerships with our community centers, federally qualified health centers or their equivalents in the academic uh, arena. And, and really, um, you want to create the interventions. Medical docs, have, social behavioral scientists have been doing interventions for a long time. Um, even in internal medicine, there's been a lot of interventions. In our prevention side, people are thinking about interventions. But cancer oncologists, 
uh, medical oncologists in particular, we have not been on the intervention side. I always say if we did a quarter of as much in the intervention access arena as we do in the clinical drug development side, we'd, we'd really be doing something incredible because we got to get the drugs that are made into to the people. And I think if you're thinking about you know, your community facing navigation, having them outside your regular system makes it very vulnerable. That grant decreases, the philanthropic funding decreases, you don't really have the metrics, even though you know it's good to show that it needs to be refunded. If you integrate it into your disease system and it's part of your functioning ecosystem, it's really much harder to take away and it has your benefit, right? So I think, you know, you really want to have that going forward. And I think that that's really, it's important. And you want to really honestly address the issues. We can't hide from some of the real barriers. Uh, we can't fix everything, but we can do a lot of things. Um, I'm going to skip this next part on transdisciplinary research. So this is really important, though. We talk a lot about transdisciplinary research, and we're really talking about interdisciplinary research. We want to talk about cross-cutting cross cross -cutting all areas, right? Clinical, translational, basic science, social science, and policy. We really don't do that. We don't do that kind of team science that they do in chemistry and astronomy. Right? We don't do that. And I think, think about outside of it, your synergies with dentists, uh, think about your oral health, we could do a lot more. So I'm going to skip over the criticism of my own program and where we could do more transdisciplinary research. This was all, you know, some work about how hard transdisciplinary research is. Great work done by Canon. And you can have my slides for later on. Um, the priorities, I think, community engagement and navigation, I think, build your access pathways, engage your face great base groups large employers, community leaders, politicians, everybody should be part of that community engagement. Listen to your catchment area and invest in expanding. And I would say, this is something that Electra Pasca said to me years ago, you wanna leave the community better than you found it when you do your research, if you're doing research. Um, and you know, we know that NCI, National Cancer Institute in the United States is really talking about uh, thinking about the organizational structure, uh, you know, they want to build on the existing strengths in basic science, but we got to really work um, to think about authentic transdisciplinary research across platform. And again, I'm going to skip over that in the interest of time. Um, here's a call to action to leave you with, right? We know, and this is uh, this picture is from the United States when, when, when Medicare was being discussed. Uh, and one of the major reasons that people were against Medicare was because of race and segregation. And, you know, uh, physicians in the United States at the time were, were very conservative and were against that. And so access to the care to care for the poor and immigrant and the first peoples and descendants of slaves has been problematic from the start. And, and you know, medical communities don't need to own that. And, you know, we were part of that. We were all part of that. And I, many people are saying, but I wasn't here then. And I, I totally hear you, but medicine was part of that. Most hospitals opposed to Medicare and race, race was a major issue. And the legacy is why we have segregated hospitals and health systems today. Um, and even though we are thinking about this, the whipsaw effect has already begun. And if you haven't had a chance to, to listen to some of the 1619 podcasts, uh, if you just want to listen to one about healthcare, when the bad butt started is a good one. And I leave you a little bit with uh, what my mom used to say. My mother passed, uh, my, uh, my mom passed from early onset Alzheimer's. And she used to always say to me uh, when we were young, and picture my brother and my sister, uh, and uh, she used to say to us, you know, I'm tired of talking when she was frustrated. And I would say that you know, I've been you know, doing this work in, in, you know, for 20 years and I enjoy talking to people, but it's time to move. Uh, we need to move from actions. Uh, we need to hold institutions accountable and we need to turn the words into deeds. Uh, and we need to aspire to lead in this space as much as we do in the basics of science and translational research. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Hopefully we have some time for questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Dr. Lathan. That was an incredibly inspiring, essential talk, actually. Um, and I certainly gained a lot from it, as I'm sure everyone viewing today did as well. Um, there are some questions that have come in. Um, just as I wait for all of them to load, I might start off with one of my own, which is actually around the primary care physicians' skepticism of the outreach program that they initially overcame. You mentioned that they did enjoy the program. They did refer patients, but that there was a bit of hesitancy. Um, which surprised me. So I would love to hear a little bit more about where that hesitancy came from and how they overcame it. Yeah, so uh, the, to be very specific, this is not, these are PCPs that are not in the academic system, right? So I think these are PCPs that are in standalone federally qualified health centers. And then when you come from the academic system and say, hey, we got this program and we think it's going to really help you. And they're looking at you like, I've heard this before. What do you really want? 
what are you really trying to do? Because you haven't been interested in our patients like this before. And so I think you have to prove to them that you're bringing something that is helpful to them. And also you have to bring something that's not gonna cause them more work because the last thing anybody needs is more work, more flags, more things that they need to be responsible for. Um, and I think that's one of the problems we've had with treatment plans and survivorship, right? We come up with those great survivorship plans and then everybody thought it was gonna be great to dump these on the primary care docs. And they're like, um, maybe not, maybe just tell us what we needed to do. So I think uh, that's why they were skeptical, but I think we kept coming back we listened to them, we showed this is what we're thinking, and then we had them involved in the planning process as much as they wanted to be. And I think as when you keep showing up on the door uh, and people can see your intentions, not just with your words, but with your actions, that, that, really, that really went a long way. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm looking away just to look at the other screen and to see the questions that are flowing in. Um, so the next question is, Dr. Lathan, we appreciate your efforts to engage community to increase access. Have you run into challenges in collecting data from those who have low trust in healthcare um, and any ethical risks along the way? Yeah, so it's very interesting. So the short answer, I mean, a short answer and a slightly longer answer. The short answer is we, our team has not had problems. Our consent rate for our cohort it hovers between 80 to 85%. Um, so in what we're doing in that cohort, you know, patients come in, they, they see our, our team, and then uh, we have a research person comes in and said, hey, can we uh, have access to your medical records for, you know, um, for, you know, for quality and research purposes, and do we have permission to recontact you for social behavioral studies? We're not taking blood, we're not taking, we're not poking anybody, we're not doing anything else. And so 80, 85%, people were surprised to see how high it was, but it was because of the warm handoff from the clinician. So when the clinician's in the room, uh, you, you know, they're talking to the patient and they say, hey, this is something you don't have to do. It's not related to your care, but you're gonna hear, you know, um, you know, person's gonna come in and talk about this. And patients who were more than happy to do that. And some people had good reasons for no, and they said no, and that was fine. I think what we talk about here on the trust, what we see in the, the data that Terry Albright has done in her group and many and folks after her up in Detroit, if you're treating patients, right, and there is a therapeutic bond, whether the patient is uh, Black or, or uh, Latino or wherever they're from, they tend to go on trials at the same rate as others if they trust their clinicians. The biggest problem that we've had is we've had institutions that are not generally treating communities coming in to say, hey, we want to do a study. And then it's hard to build trust. And then people are saying, I don't know. The second part is gatekeeper. So what I would say is we were ready to kind of move to biospecimens. I have no, no doubt that we would have been able to consent patients up to like 75%. But um, the gatekeeper at the medical center said, I don't want you to approach my patients about that. And because of the system that we set up to be very respectful of the administrative leadership there, we respected that. But I, I would always say, well, why don't we... Why, let us ask the patients and, you know, they could tell us, but there are still some gatekeepers who are like, I don't trust you. And I think that has actually been more of a problem than we thought. I think when you get to individual folks and you explain things, you know, people, you know, and it, there's other things you have to have, you know, people who are culturally competent in there who can sit and listen. And I think doing your research programs when they're in the development phase and talking to people then, as opposed to, I need to recruit X amount of people, and now I need to go to this uh, church or community leader, or uh, that's when we have problems. So that, that's my that's what my uh, team's experience. Thanks so much. And I think that's actually a perfect segue and just kind of focusing in on this theme of trust uh, that came out of the last question as well. Um, it was mentioned at the toward the beginning of the talk, actually, just that there exists, um, I guess, poor perception of mm -hmm. cancer centers in communities of color because they're seen as ivory towered. Um, and uh, the question is, is this exclusively, is it exclusively the academic focus and this kind of our ivory tower perception that drives this poor perception? Or is it also that the number of Black or African American doctors within the cancer centers um, aren't there? You mentioned 4% in Boston, 2% in your institution. Um, so I guess, I guess the question is, is, is that the primary challenge uh, related to poor perception or is it the ivory tower bit? Yeah, so uh, like many things, I, everybody wants, so I think the, the patient physician dyad is important and there's some data on this and having uh, a clinical staff that is more representative of the communities that you're treating is extremely important. And there's data that shows that that's important. It is not the only thing. 
And I say this because for a couple of reasons, right? So yes, it is important and we need to improve the pipeline, which is why I talked about that earlier. That's gonna take decades, right? It's gonna take decades. I think the other problem, when I first came in in Boston, the cancer center actually sits in Mission Hill, which is, which is uh, uh, it, it's a community, it's a, it's, a, it's a community of color. But I will tell you something, I trained at a city hospital and they did have a higher percentage of African-American patients, but they didn't, uh, African-American physicians, but it still wasn't representative. But they knew that that hospital had been there to treat them, meaning their cousins, their brothers, their sisters, everybody went there, whether they complained about it or not, they went to that hospital and they knew that was, they were there for the community. Cancer centers, because of the nature of the way cancer goes, we're not in the community the same way our clinicians are. People come to us. So I think that di that dynamic is one thing. Two, in the United States, there were real insurance barriers. There were some cancer centers that do not take safety net insurance. Well, that's not an imagined process. That's a real barrier. Then you have the referral processes. So our cancer center has always done it. But then I did a focus group in one of the housing projects and we asked patients, would you come to the cancer center? And they said, oh, I think you have to know somebody special or you have to have a special referral to get there. So even though the insurance barrier wasn't what they perceived, the historical barriers of, you know, people didn't, weren't really looking for that. And the last thing I'll say about that, when I first got there, they did market research about Dana-Farber. And when you go to the communities in and around Dana-Farber, the affluent communities, people go, that's where I want to get my second opinion. When you talk to, to working poor communities of all races, but when they talk, this is true, but specifically for Black communities, they said, that's where rich white people go to die. That was their perception. It's an experimental place where people go and it only seems to take white people and there are only white people in there. And so to do that and to break through that, you have to continue to be present in communities. And that's where I think the cancer centers have not done their part. Yes, pipeline, but also there's an opportunity to build trust with people and to continue to show that you're, you're part of the community and you care about the community. Thank you. That was clearly a lot of work to be done. And I think the offered some very concrete ways that we can try to improve the poor perceptions that currently exist um, among certain populations and cancer centers specifically. Um, the next question that came in is, just, this was a fantastic doc, talk. Thank you so much, Dr. Lathan. You mentioned pathways to reach marginalized groups for clinical care. Um, there's been a lot of concern and efforts on the part of the NIH and others to reach these communities for clinical trials. I wonder if you could say a bit more about how to engage with these communities on the issue of clinical trials, which are so important for generating evidence that can benefit the groups most impacted by cancer, um, those marginalized by race and class, for example. Yeah, so that's great. Now I have, there are some slides I took out for time, specifically uh, some of the work that we're doing in the clinical trials access community, uh, committee. But to answer the question generally, so the, the questioner is right on with this. You know, NCI and NIH has, has really said, okay, we really want to get uh, more uh, broad participation in clinical trials. Here's the thing, and this is something anybody who's known me know I've been saying for 20 years. We can't skip over the treatment part to get to the recruitment for clinical trials. So what happens is somebody says, Chris, we need to get a higher percentage of X amount of patients on clinical trials. And I say, awesome. Who are you treating here? And they're like, well, yeah, yeah, we know we're not treating a lot of people here, but how do we get to that community? Look at the data. If people are going, when people go to the cancer center, when Black folks show up to the cancer center, they go on clinical trials at the same percentages as white folks do, okay? And this is true for other groups. So what we're seeing is, it's a combination of, are people being asked? Do they have the opportunity? And then yes, don't get me wrong, there, there are history of Tuskegee and other maltreatment that is there, but we are trying to skip over the part of the therapeutic uh, uh, aspect of this, right? And if you look at pediatric oncology, a majority of their patients are on clinical trials because really you're going, when you have pediatric cancer, there's only a few places you're gonna go. And so they have a, a broader demographic. So we are in this situation where we have hospitals that are not treating, uh, they're treating a very small percentage of their own community. And then they're asking, why don't we have more patients on clinical trials? And then they specifically try to go out and target a specific community for clinical trials. I think both of those things need to be done, but I think it has to be linked to the overall community engagement. So you have to go to a community and you should be educating about clinical trials without an ask. You have to have a process where people can come in and where we're really showing you, we, we care about your cancer diagnosis, we're gonna help you get diagnosed. And then you can do your social behavioral work. And the last thing I was gonna say, we're using our network for this. So we're, 
one of the reasons I took on some more administrative roles is I saw that the opportunity to put some of our network sites closer to marginalized communities would help here. Because then, yes, we're here and we're treating and we started with social behavioral studies first, and now we're bringing more therapeutic trials because, again, people trust their clinicians and they want to have therapeutic uh, bonds. And that really helps. So I think we need to have a, a specific targeted education plan. I think a lot of the stuff that's being published on inter interacting with communities and giving going through things all makes sense, but we don't want to forget that you st it still doesn't work if you're cancer center, your treatment center is not actually treating communities of color. And I think that that's the key. Uh, that's really the key. Yeah, that makes sense. It seems like a lot of your talk has really um, influenced me to think about engaging with people at the right time and in the right kinds of ways, and that there are certainly gaps in the ways that we're doing that right now, or that we're just not doing it at all. Um, uh, comments came in just, yeah, lots of thank yous. So thank you for your insightful presentation. Can't wait to see its positive impacts. Um, the question is, thanks for this excellent talk. Might you comment or reflect on any implications following from this work for the training of health professionals? Yeah, so th that's a great question. So I, I, I pause here for a minute because I think there are so many things in the training of health professionals and I'm gonna speak to medical training because I'm most familiar with that. But I think this is true for other health professionals, um, where we are we get a health stream or a virtual thing or some classes that talks about um, social determinants of health. They're doing a little better job of that. Most of that being pushed by the students, by the way, not necessarily by uh, by but you know, you know by medical schools and et cetera. But I do think um, again, many of the places that we go for higher level training are places that have the problem we just talked about. They're not seeing. Um, they're really not seeing uh, communities, whether it's really rural communities or poorer communities and certainly um, ethnically diverse communities. So I think in our training programs, we really got to think about, um, how, especially medical oncology, uh, academic medical oncology should probably also have a tract where there is community engagement and we need to build that out and maybe rotating in different places. Uh, in the United States, it can be some veteran centers. It can be actually thinking a little bit about it in more diverse areas. I think we need to build out that track because it isn't there. I think if, when my fellowship, when I came in, I said, I want, I don't want to go into the lab. I just want to do, I'm really interested in health policy and health disparities. And I was very lucky that people wanted me to do that, but it was still all um, uh, large database analysis. And the engagement with communities I had to make happen myself. And I think, I think there's an opportunity now for us to think about that. And there will be a publication coming out in JOP probably um, in the next couple of months. Uh, it's still embargoed right now um, by another colleague who's talking about the academic community hybrid and thinking about a different model for training and how we can use that model to help with some of these issues. So stay tuned. Thank you. Myself and I'm sure my others are looking forward to reading the publication and learning from it. Um, and in relation just to community engagement, um, and again, another perfect segue just around doing really good community focused work. And how do you actually do that, particularly if the perspectives needed, maybe those who have to work multiple jobs, don't have the finances to travel? How do you engage with them well? Yeah, I think, and, and this is getting to you, like, I think we have to build that in a little bit. Um, so look, we let's talk about academics for a minute. People, not everybody has the opportunity to get out into the community all the time, right? You, you don't have the opportunity to do that. And some people are not very good at it. I always say I have great colleagues and I don't want them to talk to a black church right now because they're not going to do a great job. That's, they're not bad people. They're just not going to do a great job. So we think we need to build in some of that infrastructure. And I think also, as we think about, um, Clinical trials, for example, if large pharma is going to be, you know, going to be doing stuff with the trial, we need to build in some money just for this. Extra transportation, things that we need to cover, covering uh, babysitting, you know, not just parking, thinking about some things that we didn't think about. Um, and we need to kind of where, where there's money to do that. Where there isn't money, there's an idea of kind of utilizing some of that money to create some institutional support. And you can add philanthropic support too, but it shouldn't be just philanthropic support that to really think about, well, what about uh, investigator initiated trials that don't have pharma? What about social behavioral trials? What about, you know, non-therapeutic trials where you, you don't have as much money in that trial budget, but you're still trying to do some of this. So I think that is one of the ways to try to get money from the institution and from philanthropy for help and create a little cushion for that. 
The second thing is uh, to utilize our technology as much as possible. So if there's an opportunity to think about this differently, if you're consenting people remotely and bring that in as well. So I, I guess it's a multi-layered approach to try to have the institution have some uh, some uh, support for this, like translating consent. I, I know this seems crazy, but there are still places where people are like, we have this trial, but it's only translated, it's only in English or it's in English and uh, it's in Spanish, but actually there's a big East Asian population. And, and, and then you say, well, can we get a translator? Ooh, it's gonna cost a couple thousand dollars and I just will exclude those. We just need to get rid of that. that I mean, there are things and there are publications that are talking about that basic language in, in trial, uh, uh, as you write your trials that are less exclusionary. I, I think there's a lot of things we can do on the infrastructure to move things forward. Yeah, thanks so much. Another question came in as well that is very much related just about accessing like expensive immunotherapy, for example. And it sounds like you would um, seek to, based on your previous answer, but feel free to, to expand as well, just that you would seek to find the funding. You used grants in your program, it sounds like as well, when it came to helping people gain access to your outreach program. Um, is that the kind of thing that you would yeah. Yeah. So I think I think philanthropy is helpful, but but in this case, if you're talking about pharma, if if pharma wants to do a trial, then we need to ask pharma to help pay for these things. And I will say there is mutual interest there because pharma wants, and it's not all altruism, but there's some altruism in there. They also want to have their drug go to the to the most people, and they have been waiting for us. They every advisory committee they say, well, what else can we do? Well, so we need to push them a little bit. They're not even uncomfortable if you come out to them and say, we're going to do this clinical trial on, on immunotherapy drugs and da, da, da. And you're like, I need X amount for this patient population. I will say that this sort of stuff, and this is where people get upset, needs to be targeted to the folks who need it the most. Sometimes people do assistance programs. And what happens is cancer is bad for everybody. And there's a relativism here. And so if there are, there are things that are going to help you, a navigation program is going to help you, but you are not, uh, you know, it's not a poverty level issue or there are not any other issues. People will use their voice and activate it and get to that information and get to that those services. Not that they shouldn't, but you need to target some services for people who need it the most. That's what the navigation data shows us. So I would say the same thing. If we go to pharma and we say, we need these things, yes. And then we should need these things for people who have these issues uh, and they should have some money for that. I, I think, I think really, any therapeutic clinical trial that is funded or using a pharma drug, I think they should be expecting a little bit of a tax if they really want to get to, you know, uh, communities that they haven't been getting to. Yeah, thanks for that answer. A follow-up just came in in relation to actually going to pharma and being situated in Canada, recognizing that we arguably don't have the, the market share. And so it almost seems like countries perhaps need to work together and collaborate on this. Um, do you have any thoughts for, for a place like Canada to, to change protocols? Pharma's protocol? Yeah, so I think, again, if you have a system that is in many, in, in, in all areas, much, I can say it's much better than the US system, it's less fragmented, and you're able to wholesale negotiate with how you, you know, disperse your the resources, then I do think then the government is the place to go to say, look, we're going to do this trial here, but or we're going to, we're going to give this, uh, this therapy here, we need more resources for the under, you know, the, the marginalized patient populations and these things, and they need to be a part of the consideration. And if you think about the metrics that people are using for your quality indicators, are you treating, are you taking care of the patients that are in your catchment area who are the most vulnerable? And it feels like to me that um, large systems, whether governments or businesses can't say, we wanna do this, but then not be held accountable for not looking at how to do it. So I, I do think, that is another way to go forward. And you can't do everything, but something has to be done. It has to be more than performative or box checking because this work tends to be done on the back of people who care a lot. I call talk about the sweat equity work. So people who care about this will try to do this work anyway. So push the rock up the hill. They'll continue to do it for ages. And the institutes, all of the institutes, that's great, good work. Nobody wants to support it. Nobody wants to promote it. But, but we now need to get beyond that and say, look, I'll do it, but you guys need to help and put some institutional help in. Uh, and I, I think holding governments, businesses, uh, systems accountable for that is really important if they mean what they say. Yeah, thanks for that. And certainly gives us something to consider, I think, here and how we can work together and hopefully move things forward in the right direction, servicing the right people. 
Um, a couple of more questions come in. I know that there's been a lot. Hopefully you're okay with a couple of more. Is that a couple okay? more? Yeah, yeah, a couple more. Yeah, no worries. All right. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, so one of them is that your your program, I think the federally qualified health center is the, the outreach program. It's led by a nurse. Um, mm -hmm. And you mentioned this nurse's name, I believe, as well. I can't recall if it was a nurse. Yeah, nurse lead. Um, was this done intentionally in order to eliminate some of the hierarchy and the power imbalance that sometimes exists when it comes to patients and physicians? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Very insightful. Uh, I, I would say, uh, honestly, I came in agnostic. I thought nursing, because I you know worked with nurses all the way through and the, the incredible roles that nurses do, a varied role all the way through, I thought, I thought that made sense to me. But actually, when I came up with the outline, I talked to our current, um, the, the head of nursing at Dana-Farber uh, back then, uh, Pat Riponti. And I said, this is what I'm thinking about. And she said, I really do. Because I was like, are we thinking about a lay uh, or, or non-clinical navigator? Are we thinking about nurse navigator? You know, what are you thinking? And, and um, she said, you know, I think a nurse navigator makes sense here because of the clinical complexity. And I would say the triaging and being able to get people into the system. I mean, you know, who, who knows better how to get people into the system than an experienced nurse? Uh, my worry was the cost. Nurses are expensive comparatively. And what nurse would take this job? and you have to have language skills. And so those were my concerns. And I would say, you know, the landscape is very different now. I, I now have people coming to me saying, I wanna do this work. And of course we don't have a lot of openings here. And I've had, you know, PAs, we now have a PA in our program too. And um, I think, you know, broadening out all the different healthcare components and specialties that can do, that can have impact here made sense. But on the navigation front, we now have both. There's some things I think where a community focused navigator does not have to be a clinician. Uh, I, I, they don't have to be a nurse, they don't have to be a PA or PA or doc. I think uh, Ludmila, as you can see now, she has a direction role and she's training our navigators. And then she is advocating for integration in the system all the way through, which is a natural evolution. In the beginning, she ran the clinic, she navigated the patients. But as we got bigger, you can't, you, know, you can't do all those things. Um, but we've had a lot of nurses come to us and we have another program where we're going to be interacting with hospitals where they're doing diagnosis and kind of help us with our satellite sites. And we're looking for another nurse navigator there. So I think there are opportunities to expand this. I think in clinical research navigation too is another place where uh, nursing could be helpful. Um, but it, you know, it, it, it wasn't just tactical. Uh, it really was an open discussion about the concept. I think in the long term, it has been the best move that we made given the complexity of oncology. But sometimes, you know, it doesn't have to be a nurse. It could be somebody else. Yeah, thanks for that. And it sounds like the perfect person to be leading this work um, who also has skills by virtue of being a nurse that are essential. So, And she speaks five different languages. I forgot about that point. So she actually... So she's Czechoslovakian, and she's, I, I get it wrong, so she speaks Czech, English, Spanish, German, French. And so that kind of, and fluent, fluent. I, I will tell you a very brief, funny story. When we interviewed her, uh, uh, I, one of my colleagues who was involved in this is a native Spanish speaker, and I didn't tell her that we were going to do, he was going to interview her, but I, but I didn't tell, I said, hey, uh, I said, Goyo, can you just, you know, check her Spanish, because sometimes people say they're fluent and they're not. And so he conducted the whole interview in Spanish, uh, which I, I didn't mean this to be a high stress interview for her. Uh, and uh, later on, she still gives me a hard time about that. Twelve years later, she's like, but, she, you know, he came back. He said, she's fluent. He goes, you know, her Spanish isn't perfect, but she's fluent. She's good. Like and, and later on, she's like, I was so scared. But, it, but I, I tell you the story because I think the language skills are really important. If you're dealing with a community, you should have somebody who can speak the language if you can, or at least somebody in the team. And it goes a long way, even though she doesn't look like she's Czechoslovakian. She doesn't look like a lot of the community there. But the minute she was there and she was able to speak to folks, you know, it was uh, it was not a problem at all. So. Oh, that's incredibly impressive uh, to learn about her, her skills, all that she brings, and she sounds like the perfect person to hopefully maintain, gain and maintain relationships with um, patients who are in need of care and support. Um, and with that, a couple more questions come in, but I'll pick one, just recognizing the time and that we've certainly taken um, advantage of your time with us, so thank you for that. Um, so this question just came in, this is first wonderful talk. What are your thoughts on partnerships with places like Walmart, CVS, as community spaces mm. to reach wider populations for things like screening? Um, this person recently read about Walmart for recruiting um, for clinical trials. Yeah, I, 
I personally think we have underutilized some of these places for one as community spaces. And I think in the UK, uh, some of the lung cancer screening they had gone to uh, different shopping marts and set up a van, set up their their van there. So I, I think that's a it's an excellent idea. So I I do think utilizing, especially as you look at um, different communities where people are going, those types of shops, and then on the employment side, I think that we have underutilized going to employers and engaging with employers um, for you know communities where you have you know you have they're they're employing a large amount of, you know a large amount of patients and they're paying in the United States are paying for insurance and other companies or in other places it's still um, I think it's a place to go uh, and to to be able to interact with them to do is it screening is it you know a part of a benefits plan you know there there are opportunities in a lot of studies if you look at a lot of these academic studies. We get to women in, in like some of our studies because we can find where the women are. We're not finding the men. Uh, now, that's not true in clinical trials, right? We know we get a lot of men in clinical trials, but I'm just, we, we recognize in working poor communities, we're not really getting men. It's, it's women. And, 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 and so if we can get to working poor people in general, in general separate from gender, but also um, really think about broadening how we interact and think about our screening programs, our, 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 our nutrition programs, and really interact to go to where the people are. If you're spending 40 days and you have an hourly job, you're working for, I don't know, Amazon, or you're working, we should be able to go to where the people are and think about how we give our medical education, not just expect that they're just going to take their time and come into our centers. It, it's, it's not going to be like that. And some stuff we can do and deliver outside. Uh, so that, that's my thinking. I think Walmart, uh, you know, different consumer stores as both community spaces and as employers are, are underutilized. Thank you. Um, you've certainly given us and me personally a lot to think about in terms of equity, innovation, and cancer care. Um, and there were a couple of questions we didn't get to, um, but over, sentiments are just so positive. Really appreciate your talk. And I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dr. Jennifer Bell, again for some closing remarks and to thank you again. Thank you, Andrea. And thank you, Dr. Lathan. Uh, it's time to draw the lecture to a close. First, we would like to thank Bill and Pat Harris and their family for providing our community with the opportunity to have these important and timely discussions about ethical issues that impact cancer care in memory of their daughter, Pippa. We would also like to thank our incredible speaker, Dr. Latham, for directing our attention to the importance of enhancing equitable cancer care for historically marginalized groups. His research not only deepens our understanding and recognition of the historical and socio-political barriers to cancer care experienced by groups marginalized by race and class, but significantly identifies steps that can be taken to address these inequities in cancer care systems and clinical practice. And I know I, I also appreciated how you went into detail about how we can make these uh, programs and interventions sustainable. Few topics could really be more relevant and pressing for those of us who live and work in Canada's most diverse city. Uh, finally, we would like to thank all of you, the attendees of the lecture who join us in real time or via the archive video. As we all know, the COVID pandemic has made us acutely more aware of the ways that social determinants of health, indeed the racial determinants of health can worsen health outcomes. We hope that today's dis discussion will contribute to collective action at addressing the devastating effects of systemic racism within our healthcare system and beyond. So with that, we would like to wish you all of a good day. Thank you for attending.